So we're very excited to be here today. Uh, my name is Kim Hale, and this is Isaac Gornicek. Um, we are very, very happy to be here today to talk with you about engaging on a virtual level, uh, being able to engage your key medical device stakeholders, but doing more than just what we've all been used to in the past. So that's what we're going to talk a little bit about with you today. So let me introduce each, uh, both Isaac and myself here so that you guys have a little better idea of, of who you're talking with. Again, my name is Kim Hale. I'm the VP team lead and for business development uh, at within three specific to the medical device industry. I've uh, been in medical device now for about 30 years. I uh, have worked for various companies such as Medtronic and Smith Medical and Baxter to name a few. Held various roles throughout those years from uh, a VP of sales uh, to just managing a small little territory in the Mountain West. Uh, I'm based out of Salt Lake City, Utah, and I've been within three now for about a year and three months, and I've loved every minute that I have been here. Isaac? You know, it's good to be with you all today. I'm Isaac Gornacek. I live in Las Vegas. Um, yes, it is a city that never sleeps, and uh, contrary to belief, what goes on here doesn't necessarily always stay here. So <laughs> what I want to share with you today is some information that hopefully isn't going to just stay in Las Vegas, and, and you all will be i um, extremely excited to, to learn and grow. I've been in the business for about uh, 20 years, uh, worked with a lot of different med devices. Kim and I actually met at Medtronic. I spent a number of weeks together in, in training, and we've just become great friends over the years and also worked for Edwards Life Sciences, Merck, uh, held numerous different management positions and marketing and sales positions. So again, happy to be here, and uh, thanks for having me on, Kim. Appreciate it. Great. Well, Isaac, as we begin to move forward, we talk about the virtual engagement strategies that people have nowadays. One of the things that I would love to talk about is really what we've learned over the last 18 to 20 months. It's very interesting because there was a then uh, that I would love for you to speak to. And then there is a now what we have learned and how we're moving forward. So I'll let you speak to this a little bit about what we were doing and then hopefully what we will be doing. You know what? We've learned a lot. And I think more of us have learned more than others. And I think it's starting to really show as we, we get into this pandemic and, and uh, uh, move and shift. But, you know, one thing about Within3 is that we've been doing this for a number of years, um, 13, 14 years uh, to be exact. And really what Within3 has, has attempted to do and tried to do and has been successful at doing with many, many companies is that they take a look at what works well, but also really what strategy isn't working so well, and especially when it comes to more of a hybrid learning. We've seen that, and we see this all the time, Kim, that, Kim, that there's mostly a, a one-to-one -one, um, choice, that it's either or, that it's a, a one-time event, that it, there's one way to do it. You know, in the past, it was either where you're going to do a live session or we're going to do a webcast. But typically, we didn't see a lot of that both were being done um, at the same time, especially not like we see in, in today's world. And oh, by the way, virtual just means webcast, right? How much interaction uh, did we really see um, during a, a webcast? I can tell you, as being a manager of a, of a team of 25 clinical and sales folks, our webcasts, our Monday morning webcasts, usually considered myself, and maybe one other person having a conversation and 20 other, 23 other people listening. I don't know how many of you in the audience could raise your hand and say, yeah, that, that was kind of what I've experienced as well. I will also say this, that promoting was really difficult, um, that you'd only get a few people that were invited. Um, I think we've all experienced this as well, where you reached out to, to as many people as you knew or you could, and whether through email or text messaging or whatever. And then at the end of the day, there was just a couple of handfuls of folks that would, would typically show up. Now, so what's the now, right? That's kind of the then. And I know you asked about the now. Well, now is much different than it was then. And I think that's where Within3 has done a really bang up job over the years of helping their, their clients to really understand that there's a better way, I would say a smarter way of doing things. My parents taught me long ago, don't work harder, work smarter. And I held enough jobs over the years that were hard jobs um, to, to know that, hey, there's gotta be a smarter way to doing it. And so now it's really finding that thoughtful, that good mix of engagement tools and, and applying them. What really works well and what's going to be the most convenient and ways to engage folks to really reach the maximum output, kind of really understand how to, to manage that, those, those insights, right, that we're getting that you alluded to, uh, Kim, earlier. Now, also, what's nice is now we can continue this conversation throughout the year. This is something that we've learned. Yeah, I think that we were all worried when the pandemic 
pandemic especially first started that, oh my goodness, how are we going to interact with our clients? How are we going to still do what we did? Um, but yet we're not going to be doing it face to face necessarily. And it may take a little bit longer to do and so forth. But we're learning that, hey, by the way, you can continue these conversations with the right people at the right time and so on and get really good engagement. Now, also what's interesting is I want to talk about um, promoting inclusive, inclusivity ex within expanded audience. You can remember what we talked about where you might have multiple people online, but you're only really working and, and communicating with just a couple hand or a handful of those folks. Well, now you can include everybody. You know, imagine being on a call or being using an, an async, asynchronous engagement, which we're going to talk a lot more about, and being able to get 100% participation. I know a lot of you are probably shaking your head like, no, that's not going to happen. I've never had that, nor will we ever have that. But guess what? The now is that you can have that happen. And the now is you can hear from more folks. You can expand your audience. You can reach people that you've never been able to reach before. And so, Kim, these are really some of the things that we've been able to, to learn and grow from. But let me ask you this, though. We talk about KOL management and tools and hybrid and so on. So I want to ask you, really, what does that toolkit look like um, today? You know, it's, it's interesting because like you just mentioned earlier, really just 18 months ago, there were two ways to engage with people. One was our live one-on-one face-to-face -on -one -face meetings. And we all did a bunch of those uh, every single week, every single month, and, and well, you know, every year prior to 2020. And then the second way was the quick, you know, hey, let's have a web meeting. Well, let's jump on a webinar with somebody. And then you had to go through all the processes of trying to schedule the webinar, trying to get everybody on the call. Uh, if you invited 20, maybe 15 to 18 people showed up. And then like you mentioned, Isaac, just like what we're doing right now, there were always just a couple of people that completely, you know, dominated the conversation at that point in time. Always so that happened. was really the yep. two ways. That, that was our toolkit just 18 months ago. Since our toolkit has expanded quite a bit, we've already talked about the live in-person meetings. We've talked about being able to record a video and be able to put it on a website for people to be able to watch at a later time. Of course, we all know email, right? I know that email is still probably the majority of how people communicate. It's the way people talk back and forth, but even email is slowly starting to become archaic. I had an individual the other day tell me that they barely, e they barely ever look at their emails because they can do more things in kind of an overtime discussion or on a Zoom call, which leads me right into the fact of, of the asynchronous platform. Now, th this is new. This is new to everybody. It's not new to within three. It's not new to the pharmaceutical world, but it is new to the medical device world. The asynchronous platform is just very simply a discussion over time. It allows you to be able to invite people in at their convenience. They can come in whenever they would like. Uh, they can do it on their mobile device if they would like to do that as well. And it just allows them to be able to talk and answer questions and give feedback and provide insights in an overtime platform as opposed to having to be on a specific call at a certain time or having to take time away from their practice or the hospital or their family to be at a live in-person meeting. So the asynchronous platform has probably really become the gold standard for being able to gain insights on specific topics and subjects and getting that 100% participation like you just mentioned earlier. But then taking it one step further is how do we take all the information we learn in that asynchronous discussion and put it to use? So we do that by collecting all that information and putting it into a digital document collaboration platform. So people can see in other business units, people can see in other organizational units, what one specific topic was discussed and what the actionable items were gained from that one topic. So again, there's a lot of different ways now and a huge toolkit with which to be able to pull from. And you don't have to use all of these, Isaac. You can use bits and pieces of each one to really pull together what you would consider to be the very best virtual engagement platform that you can possibly have. So let me just ask you this too, Isaac, what is it that you would consider that we have seen really in the virtual engagement platform? What are some of the considerations that, that your clients, my clients, other clients are currently looking at? You know, it's, it's a really good question. And I think and some folks are considering it. Some of folks, some folks have actually done it and they're, they're moving beyond just considering it. Other folks are still trying to figure out what to do with virtual engagement. It's very new for their company. It's a, it's a, it's a break from what they've done in the past. 
But we are seeing more of a proactive approach versus reactive, right? Especially going back 18 to 20 months. Take COVID, for example. We didn't know a lot about it. And so going back to February of last year, there was a ton of reaction, right? Masks on, mask off, um, and so on. Then we moved to the vaccine. Do we take the vaccine? Don't we? What, there was very little science. We just And so there took a lot of, of work that went in before people finally started to be a lot more proactive with things. And I think it's the same way in a world of virtual engagement. We have all of the information now. We have the studies. We have the data. We have the experience of running multiple thousands and thousands of sessions that are showing us that, hey, being proactive with a virtual engagement strategy is much more effective than just simply reacting to sitting back and just allowing it to, to, to and, and then trying to, to react to something that you're, you're trying to play catch up to. We've also seen that now there's much more of an expanding engagement opportunity. There's a lot of different ways to engage that unlike we've ever had um, before. And so I think it's key for folks to really take a look at what they're currently doing or what they did in the past, what they currently are doing and really what does their future look like? We're already moving into Q4 of the calendar year for 2021. What does 22 look like? You know, there's gotta be sessions and different uh, advisory boards, for example, that are being planned. And ultimately, how are those gonna be, how are they gonna take place? And what's gonna be the most effective way to, to, to bring them? right to, and to invite people and so on and so forth we know update, updated security and compliance is important we've seen a lot more emphasis on this i don't think i need to hammer that point home at all kim but it's definitely something that we have to think about depending on the virtual platform that we're using our approach um, is it right for our company who's engaging is it internal is it external there's a lot of different things that we have to think about more so than just hey is this a safe environment for us to talk um, and then again, I touched on already uh, planning for the future and really what does that look like? So, and I so, think it's kind of interesting, right? Of what, what the considerations are. And I mean, you see it every day, you know, what some people. Yep. Well, let me ask you a question then. If we've got a great toolkit with which to pull from now and we're seeing what people are right now considering uh, for their virtual engagement, maybe as, as opposed to looking at how this virtual engagement comes together, but ultimately what is the goal of the virtual engagement? I think we've spent so much time talking and worrying about how we're gonna set up a, a you know, webinar, a Zoom call, a GoToMeeting, a WebEx, a Teams meeting. We spent so much time trying to get everybody uh, and all their schedules worked out so that somebody in New York City can be on the call with somebody in China. We've spent so much time putting into that that we've lost the focus of what it is exactly that we want to try to solve with this virtual engagement. So if you take this, this considerations, you take the toolkit, what does an actual virtual session look like, Isaac? How does that come together? You know, good question. And I'll, you know, let me share this with, with everybody because you're right. I mean, how do we bring people together in different time zones, different continents, different, right, different cultures, different languages, all of that. And if this particular example of a virtual hybrid I think, discussion is really, really, work, bodes really, really well for that approach. And typically what a hybrid discussion consists of is a kickoff webcast. I think everybody's really good at doing this part, but what's really the differentiator and I think really makes the biggest difference and impact is this async session that also starts at the exact same time that this webcast happens. And this Q&A, the insights, the discussion, whatever the scope of work is that you're working on, it could involve advisors and moderators and working together, collaborating, communicating back and forth, all being done asynchronously. And then maybe by day 10, day 11, you have a webcast, you have another webcast, because I think it's important to still bring folks together. And what we've seen, Kim, by the way, is that second webcast, there's a lot more participation on that one than there is in the first one. Why? Because people have already been communicating for 10 days, talking back and forth. So when they get on a webcast, they already feel like they know each other. And they've already in that, that they're a lot further along than they were on day one. And then after that, that second webcast, there's deliverables that are shared, goals, making sure that we're, we're that everybody is working through um, the steps that need to take place before the session closes. Once that session closes and we talk, we start talking strategy, right? We start talking answers now because we have all the data. And so there's usually a results call that's made. Uh, what's, what's really great is Within3, for example, provides an executive summary after every session. So it's not just data, but it's also answers. And so really, this is the way that we've seen them done, seen uh, this virtual hybrid discussions happen uh, most effectively. And hopefully some of you are on this call going, you know what? Yeah, this is what we do and it works really well. But I imagine there's plenty of folks on here that are going, you know what? Maybe we ought to look into doing something like this. So, <laughs> but let me ask you this, Kim. I, I, I got to ask you this question. So 
now we have a little bit of a better idea of what these hybrid you know, discussions look like. And we've talked about the, net, the then and the now, but so now this poses a question, hey, what opportunities do clients reference really when they're, when they're taking a look at their virtual engagement strategy? You know, I, I love the word here is the opportunities because there has been multiple opportunities that have been engaged uh, that we've all you know seen over the last 18 months. It hasn't all been a huge step backwards. Maybe it has because we didn't get to stand around the water cooler. We didn't get to go to the national sales meeting. We didn't get to, you know, meet our friends for lunch every single day, you know, while we were going into the office. But there have been some huge opportunities that have come from this last 18 months. And really with the virtual engagement platform, especially the overtime discussion type of platform, is we've been able to see really six extremely important ways. Not only can we save money, uh, we can save money from travel. We can save money from having to travel people in for those one-on-one -on -one discussions. But we can now we extend, we can diversify from the people that we have normally talked with and expand our reach. We can include more people than we've ever included before because again, we have the capability of having that inclusivity that's available to us. We have the ability of, of sustainability, of being able to kind of go outside and think outside of the box. You know, we want to talk to people who can positively impact, you know, the world can positively impact, you know, our company. And so we can really begin to think outside of the box a little bit more. The next, you know, huge opportunity that has been given us is that work-life balance. You know, it's a lot easier to come down to my desk in the mornings and get on a, a few, you know, webinars than it was to hop on an airplane and fly to New York and, and then down to Memphis, Tennessee, and then over to Dallas, Texas to meet with people face-to-face. -face. Though I miss those times, it sure saves a lot of time and saves a lot of money to be able to be able to engage virtually with these people. And because of that, too, the global connectivity has become huge. You know, we can have a call with somebody that's based in China, somebody that's based in Australia. We can have calls with people in North America, Latin America, wherever it might be. So our global connection has increased dramatically as well. And you know what the best part of all of this is, Isaac, is the fact that this all eventually trickles down to the patient. That's the ultimate goal here is to be better for the patients to find better procedures, better techniques, you know, better devices that are going to help the patient ultimately, whether they're sitting in a, in a hospital room, whether they're home and in bed, you know, whether they're just visiting their physician online with a virtual appointment. Those are all ways that and opportunities that have been presented to us, you know, over the last 18 months. And I hope, I really hope that everybody that's listening to us today are has ideas, ways of being able to start putting that type of, of plan into place. So Isaac, let me just ask you this. What are some of the challenges that your clients have had managing their insights nowadays? I, I mean, because the virtual engagement process has sped up the information gathering process, we don't have to, to fly to all these different places. We don't have to invite people in. We're gaining our insights faster. So how do we manage those insights? What's a better way to do it? You know, there are there are better ways to do it. And it's interesting. You spoke about geographical gaps. And then I think we've done a much better job of closing those gaps, of fixing, right, of being able to travel throughout the world or not necessarily we can travel from st staying at home, so to speak. Um, you know, but the problem is, has been the challenge, I should say, and maybe even an opportunity now is because there's so much information that is coming in that, and there's so many insights that are being gathered, well, that's great, but how do you make sense of that, right? How do you make sense of that critical information? So I think that the challenge really that a lot of companies are, are dealing with right now and the conversations that I've had with them is that what do they, how do they make sense of this insight information? Do they, do they employ, they turn this, this, these insights over to their medical writers that are employed by them to, to gleam and to, to, to manage and to, you know, how do they, what information are they ultimately getting back to then we can we can continue the conversation, continue the project? You know, critical information comes from a lot of different sources. Um, it might be come from a key opinion leaders. It might come from multiple teams of people. But yet at the end of the day, what's most important is what does that mean, right? Ultimately, how do you use that information effectively? How do you share it? 
Um, if you don't do it effectively, it's extremely expensive. You talked about cost and the cost of, it's not just travel costs. It's not just the cost of building a building, but what are the opportunity costs that you give up by not really being able to manage those, insight, that, that info, those insights that are, that are coming in? I think it also boils down to selecting the right people. Kim, I think this is a challenge that uh, the companies have, especially when they're taking a look at engaging key opinion leaders. I think that it's also choosing the right venue. I think we've already touched on this point, but it's like how often did we, a majority of the time was spent on what hotel are we going to go to? What food is going to be there? What does the agenda look like? Traveling in and traveling out, right? When are we coming and going? Are we planning around holidays? Oh my goodness, there's a hurricane. What are we going to do about the hurricane that's, that's going to hit, right? Or the, or, and so on. And, and then, so it's ultimately how much time do we spend on that versus really spending time on what matters most is again, grabbing those insights. And then thirdly is really, are we, are we looking at the, the, the results? Are we looking at the correct results? So, you know, that's, that's something that I wanted to share as far as what challenges, that's typically what I'm seeing. So. Well, on, on the, the companies now that, you know, being able to select the right venues, you mentioned, being able to have actionable results uh, at the end of that as well. It all starts with selecting the right people. Uh, you talked, you just mentioned to that, that's the reason I pulled this slide up was because I wanted to be able to have you expand a little bit on, on how you can now get away from your typical group that you've always used in the past months or even years. How do you expand that reach outside of the typical KOL? How do you find new people with which to work with? You know, it's interesting. Is this, and this is always a good question. And I, I, I come back with another question. I'm like, are you using old methods? Are you using kind of the new normal, the new methods, right? Which, which are taking into account all of this artificial intelligence that we're able to gather nowadays. Are you looking at social platforms? Are you looking um, really, are you seeing the unseeable necessarily, the invisible colleges that are out there? You know, are you truly expanding your reach beyond what you've just typically, typical lists have been, right, in, in the past? I think that's important. And really it is like, can you identify who do you want at that table? Is it typically you're just inviting those at the table that have typically come? I love my family, but for instance, and they're the ones that are typically around the dinner table, but I'm not going to invite them if I necessarily need something uh, when we're talking uh, global medical strategy, right, to launch a new product. There's other people that I, that I want to reach out to and that I would hope that I could right, bring in and bring on board to really gleam insights from. So I think that's, that's ultimately, there's a lot of tools that are out there. I think within three, we have some of those tools and, and be able to, to work with people one-on-one. -on -one. But I think, Kim, at the end of the day, it's important, to, again, going that back to that question, are you using the old methods? Are you looking into the new methods? And let me ask you this, though, because, I mean, we talked about a lot of things today, but so now we get to the point of, hey, what are companies thinking? And so how, how will companies rethink the future of engaging with med device cust customers and role? And ultimately... What is their contingency plan? <laughs> yeah, let's hope they have a contingency plan. That's probably <laughs> the biggest thing. Um, you know, it's interesting because as, as we talk to companies, both you and I and, and other people within three, we hear a lot about, well, we're going to go back to the old way of doing things, which was the one-on-one -on -one meetings. And I hope that's not the direction that people are going. We've, we've learned too much in the last 20 months to go backwards. Uh, it, it's interesting, you know, as you were talking about the insights gap, Isaac, and one of the things that always makes me laugh is we, we got pushed forward by five years into the virtual engagement platform. And then I always ask the question is, well, on your Zoom calls or your team meetings or whatever it might be, how do you measure your ROI? And they say, well, you know, it's difficult because there's a lot of people talking, but usually what we do is we assign a scribe, somebody to take notes. And it just makes me laugh because just that comment alone makes me think that we just took that five years and flushed it and then moved backwards by five years because there are better ways of doing things. There are better, you know, if, if a fly buzzes around the note taker's head and they miss five to 10 seconds of that most important part of that critical meeting, then what happens? I'm, I'm sorry, Kim, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, Kim, what did you say? I got distracted. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, you know, if that person has a sick child at home and they're thinking about, wow, I wonder how they're doing and, and are they feeling okay? And I need to give them a call. I hope this meeting ends up quicker than, than it was supposed to so I can give them a call. They just missed 
something. You cannot be focused, so laser focused that you're getting every single thing said in these meetings. So I'm hoping that companies have a contingency plan. And let me tell you what that contingency plan should look like from a within three standpoint. Number one, you need to have the process of, of selecting the proper audience. Who is that audience going to be? Not just relying upon your reps in the field to bring you the best KOLs, the people that buy most of their products, but really diving deep into who are the people that make a difference? Who are the prescribers? Who are the, the writers of the prescriptions? Who are the people that really matter? And those are the ones, the rising stars, the falling stars, the people, yes, the people who get published. You know, let's talk about sunshine data reporting and how does that play into selecting your audience? Mm -hmm. Find the right people. That's the first leg of this three-legged stool. The next is connecting with them. How do you connect with them? You take them out of their practice and bring them into a, a meeting, a one-on-one -on -one meeting? No. Most physicians aren't going to do that anymore. So what we do in the very most effective way to do this is an asynchronous or overtime discussion. That's what you're looking to do. Allow them to come in at their convenience. Allow them to, to be able to participate and not only answer questions, but add to those questions as they have additional thoughts maybe a day or two days later. Whereas on a Zoom call, you, you, your best thoughts always occur after the call has closed. You know, and then lastly is being able to take those insights that you've gained from this overtime discussion and provide answers, answers to the topic, you know, build ways to actually have actionable insights to be able to move the company forward or move the topic forward. You know, that's what this is about. And not just taking literally hundreds of pages of transcript, but condensing that down to, to an executive summary that can be used immediately to help make decisions. That's an insights management platform. That's exactly what Within3 can provide. And, and hopefully, if some of you have questions and ideas or would like to talk to more with us about this, Isaac and I would love to be able to do that. So any questions that you guys might have, you know, we would love to be able to, to answer those for you. So what I'm going to put up here is a slide really quick that has both Isaac and I's information on it please feel free to reach out to us via our phones or via email that you see right here. It's just first, first initial last name at within3.com and we would be extremely happy to answer any questions that you might have. So for everybody that, that watched this today, thank you very much for your time. We very much appreciate it. And we hope that we were able to provide you some very good things today with which to think about and that you can share with, with your colleagues and stuff at the companies you work with. So thank you very much. Have a good day.